Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, welcome to the 11th lecture of the We High Postgrad Seminar Series. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge people and country. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting, the Wundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay respects to your elders past and present, um, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Now, I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for today's seminar, Professor Stephanie Gra. Stephanie is a professor, lab head, and an NHMRC senior research fellow at La Trobe University with a research focus on viral and structural immunology. Prior to this, she held a 14-year tenure at, as lab head and associate professor at Monash University, where she was awarded a future fellowship by the ARC and senior research fellowships by Monash and the NHMRC. Her current lab's focus is to gain a deeper understanding of how the immune system detects and eliminates viruses, as well as the ability of viruses to mutate and evade immune surveillance. Today, she'll be giving, a, uh, giving us a talk about immune signaling from a structural biology perspective. I'll hand it over to Stephanie to begin her talk. Thank you very much. Fine. Thanks for the kind invitation. And it's my great pleasure to give you this lecture today. So what I'm going to talk today about is the art of making crystals. Why should you use structural biology to understand immunology and how you can combine together to get a deeper understanding of our immune system. Um, if you haven't met me before, I'm from France. This is where the accent is coming from. And I moved to Australia 17 years ago to do my postdoc, and I decided to make Australia home. So this is my new home at LIMS, at Latrobe, since uh, two, and a, two and a half years now. All right. So I've done a bit of everything. I've been interested in a lot of different things. So I've done master in biochemistry and start working on viruses, HIV and HCV. Then I've done an honors in physics and a PhD in crystallography and working on more viruses, CMV. Then I moved to Australia to work on flu and ABV and after the leaks just get expanded. And in 2020, we started working on SARS-CoV-2 in my lab because the lab really wanted to contribute to this pandemic. So I've been called a biochemist, a physicist, immunologist, and quite lately, a virologist. This one is, the virologist is probably the less accurate of all. But basically, the idea in my lab is to really combine the biochemistry, the physics, and the immunology to gain a deeper understanding at the atomic level of what is happening at the cellular level. So for the students, if you've been classified as one thing, it doesn't mean you can't do another thing, just explore and just do biomedical research at the end of the day. Our research, um, the research of the lab, is to go from the patient all the way to the atomic level to be able to make drugs and go back to the patient and loop the loop. So we have volunteers, whether we um, from the community or in collaboration with clinicians, we get blood or tissues, and we get the immune cells from those blood or tissue samples. We look at the functional profile with immunological assay. We look at the sequence of the receptor for T cell, B cell, and antibody as well. And we make 3D structure of those ones to understand how they interact with viruses. This allows us to make new drugs, new design of T cells, and to go back to the patient. That's the philosophy of the lab, having expanding across multiple different fields. So we focus on T cells and viruses. And so if you have a cell that is infected by a virus, part of the virus will go to the cell surface and the has a red flag for the human cells to come and kill these virally infected cells. On the surface, the HLA molecule, and we'll talk a bit more about this molecule after, will bind to a small part of the virus that we call a viral peptide, and this gets presented to the TCR on the cell surface of the T cells. So the TCR is a T cell receptor, it's membrane bound to the T cells, and it's the one responsible for the recognition of the peptide and the HLA. And upon that recognition, the T cells will get activation signal and start killing the infected cells. And my lab really focuses at what is happening between a TCR, a peptide, and an HLA molecules, and how we can understand this interaction to provide better therapeutics. Mm -hmm. 
So for today, we'll get the lecture in three different um, components. So the first one is to talk about X-ray crystallography, because that's my field of research, and how X-ray crystallography is made, how do you make crystals, why do we make crystals, and why you should care about making crystals. And after, I'll show you how we use structural biology to understand T-cell and T-CR receptor interaction. And at the end, I'll tell you a bit about our research on COVID-19. So first part. This is actually what crystals look like. This is protein crystals. Why do like crystallography so much? Because you can make some pretty shiny crystals with protein, and they're very pretty. I've been doing that for 25 years, and I don't get bored of seeing them every single time. So the first thing we are looking at, imagine a tennis ball. This is the scale and go all the way to the atomic level of what a water, a water molecule will look like. What we're really interested in is that a cell is quite smaller compared to a tennis ball, but a virus is even smaller. The small molecule drugs like aspirin is very tiny. And what I'm looking at is something that is 10 million smaller than a tennis ball. So it's extremely small and we need powerful tool to be able to see this atomic level. So how do we see atoms? We get what we call electron density map, which is the blue mesh on your um, on this one. And in the middle, you've got an amino acid. So what we do is that we look at the interaction between proteins at the atomic level, and it's really looking at which atom interact with which atom and how that drive recognition and activation of cells. And we can look at how protein binds different lipids, different peptides, metabolite, drugs, and so on. So how do we make crystals and why do we make crystals? So crystals, it's a way of amplifying the signal of a single molecule into an orange packing order. So if you think of a brick and a brick wall, the brick is your protein, the brick wall is your crystals, and the bigger is your wall, and from, from far away, you'll be able to actually see it. We take the crystals and we go to the synchrotron in Australia, or we go, um, we can have X-ray source within labs. So this is the Australian synchrotron, which is located in Clayton near to Monash. This is a crystal in the loop, which is about 50 micron big, which is small. And this is what we get when the crystals get uh, shot by X-ray. It's what we call diffraction pattern. So it's an image with multiple dots on it. And from this, we get a 3D structures. So first thing, what do we need crystals? So if you imagine a single molecules, the single will be very small. But if we start compiling 10 to the power of 14 different protein, which is what happens in the crystals usually, the single will get amplified. And as long as all your protein have exactly the same shape and the same structure and they line up perfectly, this will be actually intensifying the single of a protein. And so the crystals, it's really just a tool to make that signal be invisible to us. Without crystals, we can't get structures. So this is a movie of crystals of lysosome, which is a protein that we use when you start X-ray crystallography because it crystallizes very easily. So that's a good way for us to get students to be interested um, in the art of making crystals. And the theory behind it is that crystallization happens by evaporation. So basically here on the top, you see a drop. I don't think you can see it. You see a drop here in purple, and this is the protein plus some crystallizing solution. So those solution, they can have buffer, they can have salt, they can have um, crystallizing, which will be glycerol, for example, and those one will just evaporate because the reservoir has a higher concentration and your drop try to become like the reservoir. And so you will get what we call evaporation, and that will precipitate, precipitate in an orderly fashion your protein. And hopefully your protein will make crystals like this one. So this is how we make crystals. Sounds very easy, but it's actually a, quite a, an art of magic because sometimes we get crystals, we don't know why. Sometimes we don't get crystals, we still don't know why. But we're just happier when we do get them. <laughs> 
and there is a few tricks to actually obtain them. Once you get your crystals, and hopefully your crystals is good quality, we freeze our crystals in liquid nitrogen to protect them from the radiant damage of the um, synchrotron beam at the synchrotron, because it's very powerful. So to give you an idea, the home source in lab, if you put your hands in the middle, which is not to be done, but if you were, it kind of hurt a bit, it will be warm. If you put your hand at the synchrotron, it will have a hole inside. That's the power of what the beam at the synchrotron looks like. So we call the beam at the synchrotron very bright. And so we, we freeze them in liquid nitrogen because they're very tiny and they're very sensitive to the X-ray beam. And this is how the hutch uh, within the synchrotron actually in Australia in Melbourne looks like. So once we take our tiny crystals to the synchrotron, this is what happens. The crystals at the bottom left rotate and we shoot the X-ray beam through it. And so we collect many, many diffraction patterns. And you see all those spots on the right, they're actually moving because that's the accumulation of the old data set for your crystals. So remember, we want to have a 3D picture at the end of our protein. So we need to collect a 3D data set, not just a single image that will look like a photo. When I started crystallography to take those kind of pictures, it took days. Uh, now it takes less time than making a coffee. So we don't have time to make coffee anymore at the synchrotron, which is a bit sad. So once you get your data, the game, the game in X-ray crystallography is that you need to like to play Lego or building blocks, how you want to call them, because what you have is a density, an electron density map, and you have the sequence of your protein, and you need to put those residues within your map. That's how we literally actually build protein, and that's how it looks like. So if you've got very high resolution, sometimes it's easy to identify the different residue. If you have a phenylalanine, it's awesome because it looks like a donut with a hole in the middle. So usually students find those ones very quickly. The other one can be a bit tricky. And if your resolution is not really high, sometimes it is a bit challenging. Uh, before, we were using 3D glasses. Um, that's what I used during my PhD to actually physically build in 3D. So you will spend hours in the dark room with your glasses in front of the computer. Now everything is rather um, faster and all the tools to actually solve structure with X-ray crystallography high evolve quite quickly. So what it looks like, you start with your Lego box. And so you've got your crystals, you might have an initial model. So if you're like me, you work on HLA molecule, HLA molecule kind of all look the same. So the shape is similar. So I can use one HLA molecule as an initial model to solve a new one. You have the amino acid sequence of your protein that you know, and you might have some part of the model depending on what you work with. And so it's a game of building, rebuilding, refining, destroying building again, but better until you're quite happy with your statistics. And there are a lot of different statistics that we need to be happy with to say that our structure is actually high quality. It's not just one type of um, correlation that we need. And at the end, if you're lucky, it looks like a tiny castle or it looks like this uh, protein structure here on the right, where you have an HLA molecule at the bottom in white, a peptide in the middle in purple, and a TCR on the top with the alpha chain in pink and the beta chain in blue. And that's exactly what we see when we have solved our structures. So we can start looking and analyzing at what part of the TCR or the peptide is interacting together. All right. How do we put structural biology and immunology together? So this movie is one way to do it. We know that T cells circulate all the time in your body at all the moment of your life. And their job, the T cells, is to go and bind other cells. And they bind HLA molecule presenting peptide. If it's a self-peptide, the T cells will say, OK, I'll see you later. I'm going to move away to the next cells. But if the T-cells come across a virally infected cells, for example, in that case, the TCR will bind to a viral peptide here in red, and this interaction will actually trigger the TCR to give a signal to the T-cells. And that signal will actually activate the T-cells that will secrete small molecules that will come and destroy the virally infected cells. And that's when everything goes well. So from that movie, you can understand that this interaction between the TCR, the peptide, and the HLA is the first key event to any T-cell activation. Without understanding the TCR interaction with the peptide HLA, 
it's very difficult to understand how T cells get activated and how we can actually manipulate them to make better therapeutics. So how does a structure of an HLA molecule looks like? It looks like this. This is the structure of HLA. So you've got the HLA class one molecule in white, the peptide in green, and the beta 2M, which is no covalently associated molecule in gray. And you can think of a hot dog when you think of an HLA and peptide complex, where the two helices of the HLA are your bread, and the peptide stuck in the middle is the sausage. So this is the top. Uh, structure, the top view of a peptide NHLA, and if you think of your hot dog, that's how it looks like. So you've got two helices that actually sandwich a peptide in the middle. An HLA molecule has six different pockets called A to F. The B and the F pocket are the most important one for HLA peptide interaction because they are binding to what we call the anchor residue of a peptide. So at position two, of the peptide, the residue will bind into the B pocket, and the last residue will bind into the F pocket. And those two residues are responsible to anchor the peptide within the cleft of the HLA molecules. And so each HLA molecule have different preference for the P2 and the last residue of every peptide, which means that each HLA molecule is binding a different repertoire of peptide. At the population level, it's a very good thing because we've got new viruses like SARS-CoV-2 that emerge. Someone will have some HLA that will be able to present peptide to T cells. So it's a way of evolution that the immune system has found to avoid any viral escape from a new virus to our T cells recognition. The very bad thing or the very bad side of those diversity is that you all have two HLA, two B, two C, so six different. They're a bit like your fingerprint, you and I, we probably don't share the same set, which means that in case of organ transplantation, this actually leads to transplant rejection because your T cells will recognize a foreign HLA molecule as something pathogenic and start attacking the organs. So like everything in immunology, there is the good and the bad, and it's never a yes or no, it's all in the equilibrium part. So the HLA and peptide are recognized by TCR, and TCR are also very diverse. So TCR, alpha chain in pink, beta chain in blue, they are made through different gene recombination, and they give rise to a lot of diversity. And this is what um, antigen binding site of a TCR look like. You've got three different loops on the alpha chain and three different loops on the beta chain, and that's the colorful one. And you can imagine them like three different fingers that will actually come and touch your peptide and HLA complex. And the TCR use that to actually really grab on a peptide and HLA to recognize it. And that's how it looks like. So you've got the TCR on the top of the peptide and the HLA molecule, or MHC, if you work with mice or um, animal HLAs. There are about 10 to the power of 20 unique TCR. And if numbers don't really um, give you a big idea, is that there is less chance for you and I to share the same TCR than for you to win the lotto tonight. So if you think it's quite difficult to actually win the lotto, it's easier than sharing a TCR between individuals. So TCR are extremely diverse. And I guess the good thing about that diversity is that TCR needs to recognize something that is extremely polymorphic. HLA molecules are the most polymorphic protein in humans. And peptide, there is an uh, infinite number of peptides because each time we get a new virus, you get a new set of peptides that HLA needs to bind and T cells need to recognize. So it's a very complex uh, system because diversity is really high, which once again at the population level, it's a good thing, which means someone will have a T cells to recognize a new virus and at the population, population will survive. When we start making therapeutics with T cells, it makes things really complicated and that's why usually T cells are not the primary target of vaccination, for example. So when the peptide and the HLA complex come together and why we use structural, bio structural biology to look at those ones, we can look at how every peptide is binding to an HLA molecule. If there are some mutation on the peptide, we might know what is the impact. Is the impact for the HLA binding or for the TCR recognition? And what does the TCR see when an HLA fix a peptide from a virus? <laughs> 
When we get the structure of the TCR peptide and HLA complex all together, we can really understand what drives the selection of specific alpha or beta chain on the TCR and of sequences within the CDR3 loops and how vowel mutation can actually impact on T-cell recognition as well. So 20 years of working on TCR peptide MHC, I'm still quite surprised about what they can do in terms of structure. Um, at the beginning of the, in the 80s, when people start solving structure of TCR peptide HLA, a lot of rules have um, been made to try to really understand and explain how TCR binds to peptide and HLA. And the more structure we solve, then the more rules we break. So that's what TCR probably the best at is actually breaking rules. So a few years ago, we identified a reverse TCR, which bind in a reverse orientation from all the canonical. And I'll talk a bit more about this. And now we know why this is happening. We saw some covalently bonded TCR with peptide and HLA. And we understand this is really important for activation. And how can that be used to actually modify the T cell response in the term of therapeutics? So this is what the structural database today looks like. Uh, you've got MHC class one that binds small peptide in yellow, MHC class two in green and pink that bind longer peptide. And short peptide is about eight to 10 residue, longer is more than 11. You have T cells that can recognize lipids and T cells that can recognize metabolite. So as long as you can put something inside the cleft of an HLA or HLA-like molecule, T cells should be able to recognize them and get activated. You just need to have the right T cells. When you start overlaying the structures, the class one, the class two, uh, the CD1 with the lipid and the MR1 with the TCR, you see that there is a consensus of how a TCR is actually able to bind a peptide and an HLA. And in terms of structure, um, it's quite funny to think that you know, TCR have a diverse, HLA very diverse, peptide very diverse. When you look at the structure, they all kind of look very, very similar. So why do they look so similar and why in your textbook immunology, you will find that the alpha chain of a TCR is binding on the alpha 2 helix of an HLA and the beta chain of a TCR binds onto the alpha 1 helix of an HLA molecules. And for a very long time, that's been very puzzling to try to understand why TCR had that kind of inherent docking mode onto peptide and HLA molecules. So like I said, if you look at the TCR orientation on peptide MHC, it looks fixed. And the idea with that is that because you've got cofactor on T cells, CD8 or CD4 for class one and class two recognition, you will have a dictation of where and how the TCR should bind. And so maybe the conserved docking mode is actually here for T cell signaling. And that's you know, it's been thought and hypothesized, but now we show that this is actually the truth. So I've been working with Nicola Gruta at Monash on the mass model of flu. And what we've been looking is at this epitope, the NP366 from the flu, which is a very immunodominant T cell epitope. So if you infect mice with flu, this epitope will actually be presented by T cells and T cells will actually really react to it. So we look at comparing the naive T cells that never seen the flu before and the immune T cells after flu infection. And this is a conventional TCR docking with the alpha on the right, on the left in pink, and your beta chain on the right. And that's how it looks like, and that's why your textbook immunology will actually say. What we found is that studying a naive TCR is that it was binding the other way around with the alpha chain on the right and the beta on the left. So it's a complete switch of the TCR that just turned in the opposite direction. And now the alpha and beta are switched. And so that was the first evidence that TCR can break the rules. They don't have to dock all in the same orientation. They can actually bind in the reverse orientation. But what does it mean for signaling? So a few years later, we actually keep on studying this one. And so what we find is that when you have a canonical docking TCR, your alpha chain and your beta chain will be properly placed for the signaling to happen because the distance with LCK and your CD3 complex will be small enough for this to actually activate T cells. If you start spinning your TCR around in the reverse orientation, your beta and your alpha chain are in the other way. And the distance is just too big for T cells to be activated. So we found a lot of those naive cells 
in the naive repertoire, but they never make it to the immune repertoire. And we think the reason is that they can't single properly, and so they're not recruited to be part of the immune response. So, of course, cryoEM has been a big revolution in structural biology, be able to actually look at bigger complex than just the TCR recognizing peptide MHC. And a big one is the CD3 complex with TCR that was done in 2019. And uh, this year, the complex of a TCR CD3 peptide HLA complex has been solved as well, um, with in gray here some antibody to stabilize the whole thing, which give us, you know, it's very good resolution is 2.7. So give us even more idea about how the TCR interaction with the peptide HLA can actually stimulate T cells. All right. So what I've been doing in my lab is actually to combine structural biology with my love for T cells and viruses, and looking at how we can actually find some information about SARS-CoV-2. So back in 2020, when we didn't know a lot about SARS-CoV-2 infection, we were thinking that on top of the whole comorbidity, your age, your sex, and your health in general, that can impact the disease outcome of COVID-19, is probably some genetic link. So we know, for example, in the context of HIV infection, some individuals infected with HIV, they have specific HLA molecules, which is HLA-B57 or HLA-B27, and that allows them to have a very strong T cell response and to control the viral load. So they remain healthy, even if they're infected with the HIV virus, and they don't need treatment and they won't progress to AIDS. So we know there are some HLA molecules that are more protective, and so they are more deleterious for disease outcome. And we didn't thought that SARS-CoV-2 will be an exception to these rules. So the basic idea of the project at the beginning was to find some good and bad HLA molecule and to try to understand what part of the SARS-CoV-2 they would present and what the T cell response looks like. So, a good HLA molecule will produce a good T cell response, which is not too strong, but strong enough and will have memory after, so it protects you for a very long time. And a bad HLA molecule might just not provide you with a strong immune um, response. And so that was really the beginning of the project on SARS-CoV-2 in the lab. So the first thing we did is that there were a lot of talk about how similar SARS-CoV-2 and seasonal coronavirus can be in the sequence for certain protein. And so we looked at that. So we look in COVID recovered individuals, and after I show you in unexposed individuals that we collected prior to the beginning of the pandemic. And this is collaboration with Corey Smith, Akirama, and Kirsty Short at UQ. So we look at this cohort, and what we find is that we find here the very top dark um, boxes, they show you how strong, so the darker it is, the stronger is the interferon gamma production by CD8 T cells. And these are all against the nucleocapsid protein. The top one, they all HLA B7 positive, which means they're all expressing HLA B7. The bottom one, they're not expressing HLA B7. And you can see that from the HLA B7, almost all but one actually have a very strong T cell response to one nucleocapsid. And that's very significant when you look at the expression of HLA molecules. They had the same antibody level. We are not express, expecting differences, but we actually show that antibody had nothing to do with that. And this is really a T cell response mediated differences. So we look at a specific peptide called the SPR peptide, which is located within the nucleocapsin, and it's an immunodominant if you are HLA B7 positive individuals. When you look at SARS CoV 1 or 2, and the seasonal coronaviruses, so we've got four in human that give you the common cold, so they are the good coronavirus. OC43, HKU1229E, and NL63. You can see that the protein sequence for the nucleocapsid, the, uh, the sequence similarity is pretty low between the pandemic SARS, the pandemic coronavirus and the seasonal ones. When you look at the peptide level, the sequence similarity is pretty high between this SPR peptide and those from the seasonal coronavirus. And at the beginning, I told you that position two of a peptide and the very last one are the most important to bind HLA molecule. And all those six peptides actually conserve exactly the same residue at position two and the last one, which means they're likely to all bind HLA B7. So what we did, we look at COVID-19 recovered samples on the top 
and we look at unexposed individuals for which we collected samples prior to the pandemic. And we met T cell lines. So we met T cell lines either with the SARS-CoV-2 peptide, which is called SPR on the left, or the LPR peptide, which is a similar peptide in OC43 and HK1 on the right. And this is fax plot. So the top one, you will have production of interferon gamma, which means your T cells are actually activated. So if we mix that line with the SARS-CoV-2 peptide, we get activation for the SARS-CoV-2 peptide SPR. We see activation for the LPR peptide, which is from OC43 and HQ1, but we don't get any activation from the SPK peptide, which is derived from the 229E seasonal coronaviruses. If we mix align with the OC43 and HK1 peptide, which is the LPR peptide, we see activation for the sars cov which means there is cross-reactivity of our T cells. We see for LPR, which is our control, and we still don't see anything for the SPK cell line. But if we actually make the cell line with the SPK peptide from 2 to 9E, we'll get activation. So it's not that the SPK peptide is not immunogenic, but there is no cross-reactivity between the SARS-CoV-2 or the OC43 HK1 cell line mm -hmm. with this peptide derived from 2 to 9E. So we did observe T cells cross-reactivity, but it was very specific toward spe uh, some seasonal coronaviruses, OC43 and HK1 here in uh, orange, and those one are beta coronaviruses like the SARS-CoV-2, but not with the 229E or not with an L NL63, which are alpha coronaviruses. But the sequence of the peptide between the 229E and the OC43 are quite similar, and so we're wondering why T cells can actually recognize the 229E derived peptide. And so, of course, what we did, we make structures to try to understand at the atomic level the differences between the SPR peptide here in purple from SARS-CoV-2 and the SPK peptide from the 229E virus here in green. And if you just focus on what the T cells will see, which is the residue that are surface exposed or solvent exposed, on the SPR peptide, you've got a lot of aromatic, very bulky residue. So the T cell will have a lot of things to see. When you look at the SPK peptide, there are less of them, so the peptide will actually look small for the TCR point of view. And if you do an overview or, or the top view of the cleft, this is how the two peptides look like, and you can see that they wiggle in different directions. What the TCR will see is something really large for the SPR peptide and something quite small for the SPK peptide. And so we think that the difference of conformation is actually prohibiting the T cell to cross-react with the SPK peptide and not with the SPR and LPR peptide. So when, especially when Omicron start to emerge, everybody were quite scared about the fact that you know, there is mutation in virus, no big deal, that's what virus do, they just replicate very poorly and make mutations, sometimes those mutations have negative impact, especially on vaccine efficiency. And a lot of paper at the beginning say that, you know, antibody are, I don't know, if you're not in the, if you're in the T-cell camp, you will say antibody are quite bad, they can't recognize variant, um, what's the point of making so much antibody to start with. T cells are better, which I love at the beginning, but we know it's not the case. And uh, T cells can actually recognize all variants. A few people actually claim that at the beginning of variation of the variant of concern. And of course, like I said earlier, immunology is not yes or no, it's all in equilibrium, and T cells will have some viral escape as well. So at the beginning of Omicron, especially with BA4 and BA5, we saw that new mutation and only two single mutation on the spike for those two ones actually really decreased the antibody, active, the antibody recognition from those virus after infection, even with BA1, or after three shots of the Pfizer vaccine. And so far, we haven't seen a variant that actually fully escaped the antibody response. It is decreased, but it's actually not really escaping. And for what we've seen, if you get your booster shot every six months, the number of antibody keeps on coming back and up after the uh, specific for the spike. So should we worry? Maybe not really at the moment, as long as your vaccination are up to date. So we look at T cell epitope that will mutate it in um, Omicron specifically. And what we looked at is HLA A29 positive because Omicron is coming from Africa and A29 is highly prevalent in, Africa popula in African population as well. So we've been looking at those two um, 
protein, OIF3, and the spike. And we've been looking at whether or not there were some variant of Omicron inside that two proteins, because those one did the strongest response for A29. So you see the big difference. B7 had half of the cohort B7 and half of the cohort B7. A29 is not very prevalent in white Caucasian, and this cohort is coming from um, Queensland. So we didn't have a lot of A29 positive individuals. But we looked at the T cell response. And like I said, this HLA is very prevalent in Africa. And so maybe there's a T-cell pressure to actually make some new mutation in SARS-CoV-2 as well, and not just antibody pressure. We look at this peptide in RF3 in pink and the spike in blue. And as you can see, the RF3 peptide doesn't mutate. The spike peptide mutate in Omicron with two positions that are actually mutating. Those mutations are not touching the anchor residue. So in theory, those two peptides from the Wuhan strain and Omicron should bind to HLA-A29. And this is the response of the OF3 or of the spike peptide in those individuals. You can see that the spike peptide is actually really, really strong in the response and activation of T cells. When you look at the Omicron peptide here, the little square bar, you can see there is barely any response from our T cells, even at high concentration of the peptide. So this is an escape of T cells. And the question why, why is the Omicron peptide not being able to be recognized by T cells, especially when we conserve the two residues that are important for binding of HLA-A29? So we've been looking at those two peptides, and we solved the structure of HLA-A29 with the YFP peptide from the Wuhan strain, and this is the structure. So you can see that in the middle, there is a good interaction between the HLA itself and the peptide. And we think that was actually making a good um, stability for this peptide. And we could not crystallize the Omicron peptide with A29. So we made a model. Um, here in yellow, you've got the two positions that are mutated. One is exposed, and it's a glycine to a serine, so not a massive change. The other one is a glutamine to an arginine. So we're changing the charge, and we're changing the size because arginine is really big. When we make the model, there is actually clashes with the cleft. So there is no space for this arginine to sit in the same orientation. And maybe actually this does destabilize the peptide. So we put this as a hypothesis in the paper, and the reviewer is like, how do you know it's the arginine? So you have to make more experiments, which we did. So we single mutated the arginine, and we single mutated the serine, and we actually show that the arginine only is responsible for the stabilization of the peptide. The mutant with the serine here in green has the same stability than the white type peptide. And as soon as you put an arginine with a single mutant in orange or double mutant in um, purple, which is the Omicron peptide, this peptide is actually really destabilized in the cleft of HLA-A29. And we think this is why the T cells can't actually recognize this peptide, because you need the peptide to be quite stable in the cleft. And so the last one I'm going to show you is that we just find a genetic links with HLA molecule and asymptomatic COVID-19 profile. So now everybody gets sick with COVID, and I've got a lot of friends that just brag about the fact that they never got SARS-CoV-2 infection before. And the first thing I tell them is that if you never get it, give me your blood, because <laughs> that's what I do. So at the moment in Australia, I know a lot of people think that COVID is, COVID is gone, but it's not actually true. Uh, we've got about 40 people in ICU and more than 1,000 hospitalization every week. And so we do have, this is about how it will go from asymptomatic all the way to critical. And we do have about 20% of the population that will be infected with the virus and don't develop any symptoms. So most of them, they actually have no idea they've been infected with the virus. Why are they asymptomatic? And do we have some super dodger of SARS-CoV-2 infection? And do they have special HLA molecule and, of course, T cell response? So a lot of people have been focused on the um, severe or critical for good reason. Uh, they were in hospitals, so you could get sample. It's quite tricky to get sample from asymptomatic individuals because they don't know they've been sick, and most of them, they won't test because they don't know. So what we've been looking, we've been working with a group in San Francisco from UCSF, Jill Hollenbach and her team, and they've been enrolling 30,000 individuals on an app. And basically, people were enrolled in 2021 and were able to say if they had symptom, no symptom, and all those individuals, they were 
um, frequently tested for SARS-CoV-2 infection because they're part of bone marrow registry. So this is the whole survey and how it looks like. At the end, what is very important for us is that we found 136 asymptomatic um, COVID, uh, SARS CoV 2 positive for infection, but asymptomatic, so no symptom at all. They didn't even realize if they were not tested that they had the virus. And so that's the group uh, from Jill who did this. We looked at HLA A, B, and DR molecules. And what we found is that if you have one copy of HLA B15, you will be more likely to not have a symptom from SARS-CoV-2, and it's about 2.4 for the odd ratio. And if you've got HLA-B15 and HLA-B15, so if you are expressing two copies, you've got eight times more luck than anyone else to actually not be symptomatic for COVID. And that was the HLA for which the stronger links was actually seen and the only one we could see in our cohorts. So there is a very strong genetic link between HLA-B15 and the fact that individuals are asymptomatic for COVID-19. And so how can some individuals actually dodge COVID-19 and remain healthy? Because we have an HLA link, of course, we've been looking for those super T cells because T cells are just very cool. And so the immune system has the ability, and especially T cells, to remember previous oncotel. So as I said to you, we've got four seasonal coronaviruses, which are the good coronaviruses, and two pandemic ones, which are the bad ones. And if you've been across, if you've been catching the common cold before, most likely it will be because of one of those four seasonal coronaviruses. So what we've been doing is that we collected blood from the registry in 19, that was collected in 90s in the US, so way, way before COVID. And we look at four different SARS-CoV-2 spike-specific epitopes that were published have been able to bind HLA-B15 and stimulate T cells. And this is the results, and that's the number of individuals that were able to recognize the, those four peptides. You can see then the second one, no individual were able to mount a T cell response. But for the third one, five out of nine individuals from the 90s were able to see this peptide. And when we look at the phenotype of the cells, most of the cells were actually memory T cells for this specific NKQ peptide from the spike. So, a lot of people recognize this peptide from the 90s, uh, sample collected in the 90s, and those cells are actually memory, which means they've seen something that could look like the SARS-CoV-2 peptide, but it's not the SARS-CoV-2 peptide because it was done way before the COVID-19 pandemic. So memory T cells are able to see SARS-CoV-2, and that's kind of the same story than the HLA-B7 story I showed you before. T cells can be there. We can have some pre-existing immunity that will actually protect the population against new and emerging viruses. So this is the peptide NKQ8 in SARS-CoV-2, and this is its homologous peptide in OC43 and HK1. There's only one mutation, and mutation is at position 8. Uh, for a glutamic to uh, alanine. So once again, we're not touching the anchor residue, so those two peptides should bind HLA-B15. We've been looking at tetramer doing ex vivo enrichment, and we see the same level of numbers of T cells that can bind those peptides in unaffected, healthy, unvaccinated individuals. And we look at double staining of those T cells, which means I'm using two different tetramer and look if T cells can actually co-stain. And when they cause 10, they're actually happening in this window over here. And we had 100% of our T cells that were able to cause 10 to those uh, peptides, which means that all the T cells that recognize the SARS CoV 2 peptide also recognize the OC43 HK1 derived peptide, which is not something I've seen before. So we are quite excited about those results. And so. What we've been looking at is whether or not position eight will actually change the stability of our peptide and know the stability exact, exactly the same. So mutation does not impact on the stability. We make some pretty crystals and show that the structure is exactly the same. Beside this point mutation between the two peptides that change, the rest of it is exactly similar, which means that the T cells probably recognize those two peptides exactly in the same fashion. 
And we also sequence our TCR. We found some TCR that were shared. So we found three different TCR shared between the court in the US, a court in UK, and court here in Australia. So extremely public TCR that is extremely frequent. We met the soluble TCR of those public TCRs, and we found that the affinity for the two peptide is virtually the same. And we've done that with the three different public TCR to show it. And so here I'll show you the first genetic link of HLA molecule um, with asymptomatic COVID, COVID profile that is likely to be due to previous exposure to seasonal coronavirus that prime your T cells. And thanks to the memory of T cells, they will actually remember and protect individual. The likely this pre-existing immunity is actually allowing T cells to recognize very quickly the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus in HLA B15 and will actually clear the virus even before you have symptoms or even you know it. And so some individuals indeed are able to dodge COVID-19 uh, symptoms. So if you remember at the beginning, the idea was to look if we found some good and bad HLA molecules, and we've got a few more from those one, but basically we had the good one, the B7, which linked to a less severe COVID-19 disease, the B15, which is linked with asymptomatic COVID-19 profile, and the A29 that will actually allow for viral escape. The good thing with the A29 is that the last version of O variant revert back his peptide to the Wuhan, so T cells are back in action in those individuals which is really good. So I would like to thank everyone that participated to all those fantastic research. Um, my lab, a collaborator in Australia overseas, are funding all the donors that give blood very often for us since 2020. And uh, thanks to all my labs. So the study on B15 was done by Dimitra, a postdoc, and Loton, a PhD student. And uh, the paper on this story just got accepted for publication in Nature, so not a bad way for Loton to start his PhD. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Stephanie, for your amazing talk. Now it can be like super jealous, very specifically for people with HLA B15. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're opening to questions now from everyone. Give a question. Yes. Great talk. Uh, the non-canonical positioning of the alpha and the beta loops, is there any way to therapeutically target that? Any way to what? Therapeutically target that. So to flip it around. Haha. <laughs> Not that we tried. It's it's a good it's a good question because the affinity of those T cells were quite strong. The thing is that if we change them around, um, you will have to actually either change the peptide HLA or you will have to change the loop of the CDR because I don't think they will flick around if we don't change anything at all. So I think forcing the TCRs to bind the other way, if it's that TCR sequence, will be really hard. So we, we solve the structure of three or four different ones that have the same beta and similar CDR3 loop, and they were all binding in the reverse orientation. But we think they probably selected um, <laughs> Almost. We think they probably selected in the thymus on the canonical orientation. Okay, we've got a question online. So it's from Xiao. Um, he says, great talk, Stephanie. Do, you, do self antigens have any unique molecular features that make the TCRs recognize them as self? That's an excellent question. That's kind of my life missions. Um, the short answer is no, we don't. Uh, we've been looking at a lot of antigen. One of the main issues is that people will most likely look at peptides that are immunogenic and not the ones that are not immunogenic. And I think if we are to understand what's the difference between them, we really need to compare both. So with the fact that now we're starting to have a lot of peptide repertoire that are eluted from uh, cells directly and identified by mass spec, we've got an opportunity to actually look at those peptides that don't stimulate T cells and see if there is something different. 
For the database we have available at the moment, between self and non-self, there is nothing that's been screaming at us, um, telling us that this one will be monogenic and this one looks like a self. They, it will be very cool. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was fantastic. Thanks, Steph. Uh, do you think that the odds ratio for HLA B15 is pretty compelling? Do you think it explains all of the asymptomatic cases or are there other genetic things that are linked or is there, are you going to keep looking? Yes, we'll keep looking. No, I don't think that's the only one because uh, B15 is about 3% of the population and we've seen that about 20% of the population doesn't get um, symptoms for COVID infection. So I don't think it's the only one. In the study that we looked at, knowing that the cohorts were in UK and in US with a lot of white Caucasian, there will be a bias of the HLA expression, of course, because HLA are map, um, genetically encoded and different between different parts of the world. So I think if we start looking in different parts, we might actually find some more, which I'm pretty sure there are more. Yep. Great. Thanks. Um, in the HIV field, for example, five years ago, so a bit, the first HLA molecules that are for controller in HIV been identified with B57, B27 in the 90s. Five years ago, they were starting to look in Brazil and in Japan as well, and they found that HLA B52 is actually an allele that is protective as well. So even with something like HIV, we're still identifying some new ones. So I'm pretty sure COVID is going to be the same. Is that because you're not B15? <laughs> <laughs> I've got another question online um, from Amy. She asked, would COVID vaccine efficacy remain longer in individuals with DB7 or DB15 so they might need fewer boosters? That's a good question. We don't know. Um, we know that, so we've been looking at the fifth dose of the vaccine in our cohort, and we see that the antibody level for spike is higher after fifth than it is after three in our cohort. So it looks like definitely if you get your vaccine, your antibody will be there. So I think there is a reason for getting the shot um, just to get your antibody to block the virus before it can do anything. Just remember with T cells, the virus needs to get into your cells. And so after this, there is a race between your T cells and the virus, the viral replication, and your T cells need to be super good to be able to win that race quite quickly. So if you are B15 or B7, I guess the question is that, do you want to play the Russian roulette or not? Um, vaccination is a personal choice. We can't force people to be vaccinated, even if we tried. Um, so yeah, it's, I would say for your T cells, probably not knowing that for SARS-CoV-1, for example, we saw memory T cells 17 years after infection, so they probably remain there for a very long time. For any, if you want your antibody to be blocking your virus quite quickly, probably yes. Thank you. I was just wondering if you have looked at the peptide binding pocket of gamma delta T cells, as well as the alpha beta, if it looks similar or not. So um, gamma delta are not really known to recognize peptide. Uh, usually they recognize pretty much everything but peptide for the moment. There are some studies in mice that actually find some gamma delta that could recognize peptide. But in human, for one, no, of, there is no peptide that's been identified to, recognize, to be recognized by gamma delta so far. But if you find some, I will be interested. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie, for a fantastic talk. Um, maybe just uh, um, can you say a few words, I guess, um, for the students about whether you would expect to see a signature in um, HLA class two uh, against um, against the virus? Um, uh, I guess primarily against people's ability to mount uh, a vaccination-induced. Uh, response since those um, provide help for 
good antibody responses. Yeah, so with the class 2, something quite interesting is that there is a lot of pre-existing immunity toward the spike for CD4, way stronger than CD8. So definitely they are part of the spike that CD4 seems to prefer. One of the main issues, I guess, so far with the class 2 is that not many peptides has been linked with the class 2 of restriction, and there is only two. There are only two that are known and well classified. The rest of them, they're not. So a lot of people use peptide pool, and after they will say, you know, UDR4, so it might be a DR4, but it could be anything else. Um, so that, that link between the two is quite complicated. On top of that, especially for HLA-DR molecules, they do overlap a lot in the peptide repertoire. And we know from our work on HIV that HLA-DR, different HLA-DR can bind exactly the same peptide and be recognized by the same TCR as well. So they're highly promiscuous, which I think in terms of linking with um, disease outcome, it makes it quite difficult. Something quite interesting in that study is that if you are HLA B15 and HLA DR4, your odd ratio is higher, but DR4 alone, nothing. So we don't know what's the link. We don't know if there is a linkage disequilibrium for expression of B15 and DR4. Uh, that's something we want to pursue. Nice. Uh, just a quick comment. Melissa's never gotten COVID despite being locked with me in a hotel room spewing virus. That's the people I want. And she knows her HLA. Um, so Perfect. I've, I've just texted her <laughs> and I'll get back to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so we've been, we, we start to recruit and look, because um, one of the reviewer on the paper asked us if you can actually get TCR from asymptomatic and kind of show that all the asymptomatic will have the public TCR to really show the link between the protection and the TCR, which hopefully we do. Have you looked at anything in relating to co-stimulation in your SARS-CoV work? Co-stimulation of T cells? Yeah from the infected cells? Um, no, so what we've been looking at is that ever we look if the T cells are able to bind the tetramer by doing magnetic enrichment directly for MX vivo without activating them at all and look at the phenotype and the TCR repertoire or we made cell lines that we activate the T cells just with peptide. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank amazing you. talks, Stephanie.